Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management and product marketing professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. My guest today is one of Pragmatic's favorite guests, Josh Martin, VP of Marketing at Perfect Sense, although we've known him through several different roles. He's got a, a very strong product marketing background, a very strong product management background, and a really good sense of data analysis and being market and data driven with the products he creates. And today he's going to talk a little bit about their journey and his journey in moving towards being a sort of data centric organization. So welcome, Josh. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Rebecca. So first, Josh, let's give us a little context. Tell me a little bit more about Brightspot and your role there and the kind of um, the journey that you guys were looking to to accomplish. Sure. So uh, Brightspot is one of the, the key products at our company, Perfect Sense. And uh, what we've been trying to do for the last 18 months, really, is uh, get more data centric to understand kind of the marketplace. And, and for us, we're in a unique situation because our technology is a publishing platform, right? We sell a CMS, but we sell more than a CMS. We sell a CMS that's backed by uh, an excellent staff of people that help your company be successful. So it's a difficult uh, needle to thread. So when we go out and market the product, we also are marketing the company that supports it because we don't work with integrators. We don't work with third parties. Like we help uh, companies implement the systems and the digital experiences that they're building. And as you can imagine, that's a it's a very difficult um, story to tell because it's not just about a feature or a technology piece or uh, an integration. It's about all of those pieces and how do you come up with a compelling story and then measure that story to see if it's going to be successful. Yes, that is a big challenge, right? And one that I know lots of listeners and myself have gone through. So tell me a little bit about what it was like when you first started, where the challenges were and how you've evolved. Sure. So when I started, it was a little over a year ago now, uh, the team was vastly different and we've been changing in line with um, a more data centric perspective. But really, when we started this journey towards where we were headed now, uh, we were not terribly data centric, right? We theoretically wanted to be data centric and we looked at some high level top line numbers like, hey, we're going to have a webinar and we got 100 registrants. That's great. But we weren't looking at things like the health of our database. We weren't looking at things like traffic to the site in any sort of level of detail. Uh, we were really focused on vanity metrics. And I think that's a key area that we've learned is that those metrics can really lead you astray. So some of those metrics that I would highlight uh, at a high level are things like you know, site visitation, right? That's a vanity metric. Leads generated, that's a vanity metric. Uh, all those top level pieces of data that you don't dig into make you feel good and they're great to uh, you know, put up on a, a dashboard somewhere. But ultimately it's about getting deeper understanding of all of those elements so that you can actually affect change within your marketing programs and your product. So if those are the, the bad metrics that leave you astray, the vanity metrics, as you call them, and it's true, right? There's not much you can do with them. They can be somewhat indicators, but they do, you know, they're mostly to make you feel good because all the arrows are going in the right direction. What metrics did you, do you care about? What are the ones you really think help you measure your business and tell whether you're doing a good job. Yeah, and uh, those are, they're always the hardest ones to actually get information and access to, right? Because when you're using multiple systems, as I'm sure all of us marketers and product marketers are using, uh, even generating a lead from Google or LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, I mean, that probably goes through three or four systems before it hits your uh, sales organization. And that's the same is true for us. So doing something that seems really simple, like how many of the leads that we generated on LinkedIn this month actually turned into a discovery call, turned into a demo, turned into an opportunity, turned into a win. And looking at that from like a cohorted monthly view, uh, what was the cost per lead? So for us, and I'm sure most people out there, you have lots of choices about how you're gonna spend your money, right? I can go to a content syndication partner and they can tell me they can get me you know, 200 leads at $50 a lead or $60 a lead or $75 a lead. And that's great. And then I can go fill my funnel. I can send my sales team 200 leads and feel good about it. But ultimately, the activation rate on those numbers are really different for every single channel, right? They're, they wildly vacillate from each of those platforms. And it depends if you're a consumer brand or if you're a B2B or if you're targeting specific segments. So it's really about getting that deep level of insight. So for us, for leads now, what we really look at is what's the ultimate conversion to opportunity? Uh, how many actually wind up connecting with us? How many ultimately take a demonstration with us? And the reason that each of those stages are really important is, is not surprising, right? 
uh, we can now optimize and adjust and tweak the process along the way to say, okay, well, I generated 200 lead sales. Why did you not get any demos? It creates a partnership. And in fact, we had a meeting uh, just earlier today, uh, sitting down to say, we don't think our cadences are working. We don't think our sales script is working. We're giving you all of these leads. How do we partner together to understand the process, see where things are falling out and improve it? Because if we were just looking at the top line numbers, we would just say, hey, we gave you the number of leads we promised and our job is done. But our job is not done. No, the job isn't done until the leads become revenue. And I, I would think right. the the stops on the way let you know, um, help you identify why that lead maybe isn't the ideal lead or if it is, if there's a problem in your sales script. How did you, do you think those steps along that process are always the same or are they unique to your company and your offering? I think they're unique to the industry that we're in, right? So we're B2B. And when I was at uh, Logi Analytics, which was my former employer and a place that you and I spoke several times, yes. you know, they were hyper-targeted, right? They had one key persona that they were focused on. So we could get really deep and really smart on that one person and have really meaningful conversations with product managers. And, and then our, our challenges were different, right? We were really focused on the competition, talking about how we were different, talking about why we were unique and what we were special at doing. Um, here at Perfect Sense, what we actually do is we have a much wider range of people that use a CMS, right? You have editors and publishers, you have uh, IT teams that sometimes manage the budget but don't actually get involved in publishing. You have new CMOs that enter an organization and want to refresh the brand. And making those transitions are really difficult. And while you do have competition from the uh, rest of your competitive set, as you always do, it's really about uh, delivering value to people along their buyer's journey so they understand that making a transition to a new platform uh, is valuable. And I think that those are kind of vastly different approaches, but ultimately you're going to see the same level of drop off. I think here, when we get a company to dem demo our product and they're serious about it, uh, we have a, a less difficult time uh, beating out on the competition because they know the value, right? They can see it. It's not a checking the box kind of a thing. Whereas at Logi, that was where we had more competition, right? We had to really focus on that stage of the funnel. And here we really have to focus on the top of the funnel because we want to convince you that making this transition, which historically has been very difficult, uh, is really worth it. And it can be simple and it can be easy and you can hit your deadlines and you can achieve your goals and objectives and uh, actually have an impact on the business by making this change. So that's super interesting. We teach this concept and it, it's not unique to us necessarily, but in pricing about you have a, a will I or a which one product. Um, and it sounds like your current product is more will I, which is why the top of the funnel, you know, it, we have a very similar thing. Should we do product management training or product marketing training? And less so about which version of that would I do? And I just never thought about then how different the focus would be on the different parts of the marketing funnel. Yeah, for sure. And for us, I mean, anybody that has a website, everybody has a website, right? And a digital experience, they have something in place and something that is at least modestly functional for them. Uh, for us, really, the the which, you know, will I or should I kind of example, which one example that you just gave is really industry specific. So if you were generating revenue from your website, if you're a media company, if you really are focused on producing the best content, getting people to subscribe, generating revenue through advertising, that's really, you, you need to have a great system and a great solution because you are constantly vying for attention. But if you're a large brand and you want to tell your story more effectively, maybe what you have is okay. Even if your team is suffering and struggling and you can't do it as effectively as you want, you may have a, you know, a more willingness and a broader appetite to just endure the pain without seeing that you know, switching to a new system could be dramatically improved for you. So even within our own go-to-market strategy, like we have two different examples of, you know, uh, which one and, and will I. And one question I have just because I'm curious, how different do you feel it is because you are marketing to marketers? Uh, it's, it's difficult, but we're not only marketing to marketers. In mm. fact, what we find in, and, you know, the challenge with working with marketers is oftentimes they're producing content in a CMS, but they're not necessarily the owner of the CMS. Yep. Uh, frequently, their IT teams are the ones that are managing that. So you have to, at some point, let people know and understand that the pain they're feeling with their, you know, enterprise system they're currently using or the homegrown system they're relying on is legitimate, right? There are better solutions out there, potentially, right? Not necessarily for everybody. Sometimes what you have is, is the best thing for you mm -hmm. based on your you know, workflow. So I don't want to be overly like salesy about it. Um, and oftentimes we tell people like, 
you know, you're using WordPress, it probably is adequate for what you're looking for. Uh, you probably should stick with it, right? Not all the time, but sometimes that's the case. So that's a challenge for us in terms of how do you find the right person in marketing? Because I can't go and spend, you know, a, a BDR's time calling a marketing manager at 8,000 companies or 8,000 marketing managers at one company to create a groundswell of support to convince people that they should buy our product, right? We have to either start higher up and have a CMO kind of push us downwards. We have to work within other departments to see if they have specific needs. We have to work IT. So it's not a one-to-one -one sale, really. We do have that kind of account-based approach where we're really trying to talk to multiple people that we believe to be stakeholders in the process. And that kind of brings it all back to the data set of what we're talking about, right? How do you use data to get smarter about what you're trying to achieve? And part of that is looking at things like Salesforce, looking at all the leads that you have coming in, um, segmenting your data appropriately You know, for us, you know, we were looking at uh, using LinkedIn as a primary channel, again, because we're B2B and it's an area that we can control from top to bottom and really get specific in our targeting. And we have segments that we use internally, but we weren't using them on LinkedIn. So we went from generating, you know, a very small number of leads at a very high cost per lead three months ago to resegmenting our data. And now we're doing 4x the volume at one third the cost. And that's all because we focused on the data. We looked at how we were winning deals, who we were talking to, who we were converting to demos, and we're successful as a result. Now, the next question is, how do those leads actually convert from there? And that's easier said than analyzed because, you know, merging the data from a budget perspective from LinkedIn with our, you know, lead funnel data that's in Salesforce is just, it's difficult to do. And it's, it's not something that is simple to go and pull a report and just have the information. So you have to make a commitment and have a willingness to say, I'm going to find a way to look at this data uh, together. I'm going to look at it regularly so I can course adjust. And that's something that we've chosen to do by um, creating kind of a quadrant view of CPL and uh, cost per click for all of our leads on LinkedIn. We have a triage uh, system in place to say, you know, this ad is working really well. Uh, it's the, the cost per lead and the cost per click is really low. Let's put some more money towards it. Or the cost per click is really high. We think that maybe we need to update the ad or the cost per click is really low, but no one's converting on the form. Let's update that. Or, you know, nothing's working on this ad at all. Let's just, uh, let's just take the budget from it and put it somewhere else. So having that level of granularity is important and looking at the data regularly is important too, because if you don't, you can't take actions to adjust your strategies quickly. So several questions. One, uh, is this stuff that you guys and your team all manage internally, or do you use an agency or a data assistance, or how, how is this effort um, resourced? So mostly we're doing it internally. Um, I, I think that uh, there are some areas where using third parties will be really helpful, um, but for us to get the level of specificity that we're looking for, we are reliant on our internal teams. So we have uh, really focused on hiring folks that have, uh, you know, a data and analytics bend. I don't want to say that everybody on our marketing team is, you know, a data analyst or, a, you know, a data scientist, certainly by no stretch of our of, of the imagination. But one of the key things that we look for is how do you analyze data? How do you work with data? How do you use data to generate insights? Because data in and of itself is not super useful until you have people on your team that can say, okay, this thing is not reaching the benchmarks of what we suspect should be the case. Here are some suggestions for mitigating it. Let's go test and see if it gets better. And if it doesn't, let's try something else. Next question on the data and the frequency of which you look at the data and the frequency at which you make changes based on the data. So we are looking at data regularly. We have a daily metric stand up and we look at kind of high level uh, information, things like, are we booking enough meetings? Are we getting enough demo requests? How are we seeing some of our major initiatives perform? So for example, we launch a new hub of content on our website. We wanna see if you know, the traffic that we're driving to that hub because we spent you know, a whole day working on it among several people is performing better. And we have benchmarks for our entire site. So we can say the typical you know, Twitter user that comes in off of um, a paid ad to a blog, for example, spends a minute on the site, right? And then they, the bounce rate's super high, right? It's like 95%, which I'm sure everybody that's paying for Twitter traffic is seeing similar numbers. So let's say we want to drive two plus page views and have you know two minutes on the site for all of those. So we, we will start tracking that and seeing it. And then if we determine that you know this hub page, which is really, a, it's a resource page for main areas of content that we have a lot of information on and that we're experts in, 
if it performs well, then you know what we should do is we should probably go build another one because there are a lot of areas that we've been successful in and a lot of areas that because we launch websites for several of the world's largest brands, we work with Amazon on their day one blog, we work with Johnson & Johnson, we work with um, you know, large companies that we've gained expertise and knowledge of how to do digital successfully at scale for global organizations, but also small companies that need uh, complex requirements. So it's all about looking at that information, trying to adjust and make improvements. Now, the one caution I would say is that you don't want to make changes before you have enough data to make a decision, right? So there are times where we'll be looking at, you know, an ad or be looking at traffic from a site after a day or two, and we'll just say, oh man, th these numbers are really looking poor. How can we improve the situation? And you just have to sometimes wait a little bit longer to give yourself, like seeing a thousand impressions, a thousand seems like a lot, but ultimately one or two days is not going to give you all the information that you need, or even sometimes a week or two weeks, depending on the volume that you're seeing, is not going to give you enough uh, information to make a, the right decision. So when we engage in mitigation efforts for our ads, we always give it at least a full week before we make any decisions about what we're going to do with that, because we've seen historically, at least on LinkedIn and on Google, that it takes about a week to get the full scale and to see those changes propagate through your campaigns. Yeah, I think both of the, the extremes here are dangerous with data. Like it doesn't do any good to have a ton of data you never look at. And it can be dangerous to look at your data and uh, pivot every day, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, for sure. Assume from those little pieces. Although I have to tell you, my team isn't going to like it when I do one of these podcasts and I think, oh yeah, we're doing a daily metric standup. That's a fantastic idea. And it's a fantastic idea to make sure that your team is focused on the items that will make, uh, that will have an impact on the metrics that matter and not, uh, there's not vanity projects there. There's not other things. It's, it's really very focused. On your daily metric standups, do you do those? Is it just the product marketing group? Is it, who, who do you have in those? Who is focused on those same metrics with you? Sure. So the entire marketing team attends. We have a content team internally that works both with the, the Brightspot team here and our customers. And then we also have uh, sales leadership is a part of those meetings as well, because ultimately if we're not all working together consistently about what kind of content needs to go on the site? How are we driving traffic to that? You know, telling the content team that we want to launch, you know, a new series of ads. Can you spin up some new content for us? Or can we organize the content in a new way? Or can we um, restructure something? Uh, we're seeing interest in, you know, XYZ topic. And then talking to the sales team regularly also to understand and say, yesterday we did this, this, and this. Are you seeing an uptick in your numbers? Are you seeing improvements in the types of conversations you're having? Uh, we're going to do X, Y, and Z over the next two days. You should probably let your team know that we might start seeing some more traffic or at least make them feel good that if they're not having the conversions and conversations that they want to have today, that we are taking steps and efforts to improve that for them and ultimately provide them with higher quality leads that are more interested in talking to us. So I think one thing that would help our audience too, as we talk about the speed of the results and the, and the speed at which you guys look at the data is to give them some sense of the size of your organization and the size so that they can compare themselves a little bit there. Sure. So Perfect Sense as a company is uh, about 180 people. Most of them are based in our uh, offices in Northern Virginia, you know, just a little bit outside of DC. The marketing team, the content team, and the sales team probably comprise about 14 people. The marketing team itself is Five. We're hopefully uh, going to be adding one more person in the near future, but we're not a huge team. I mean, we're not a huge company, but we're, you know, a decently sized company and uh, our team is very nimble as a result of that. So while we have areas of expertise and ownership within the team, there is, there are areas of overlap. There continue to be areas of overlap and I prefer to have that so that, you know, someone can actually take a vacation once in a while, but I don't <laughs> want to have, yeah, I don't want to have a hundred percent overlap because then, uh, we're just not large enough of a team, right? I don't have five people. I always remember hearing about, you know, folks that worked in product marketing at a large company. They'd be like, oh, well, I only focus on competitive enablement. And I was like, man, that's like 5% of my job. And there's no right. other than me doing it. <laughs> um, so we get a lot of exposure to a lot of different areas. And part of that is having folks on the team that are data centric, but also having folks on the team that want to do more and want to learn more. And we've been very fortunate with the people that we've hired and the people that have been on the team for a while now that we have 
you know, those types of personalities that will step up and say, okay, I haven't done this before, but I'll figure out how to do it. That I think that's important information for the listeners because while Perfect Sense isn't a huge company, it, it's, it's, you know, it's small-ish, medium-ish maybe, um, but the, this type of being able to focus on data and to have this type of attention to those areas is important and is possible for companies of all size. Yeah, I think that you're, the key word that you have there is focus. And that's really important because you can do a lot of things poorly or you can do a couple of things really well. So when we were going through some team transitions, some, some people left the team, we were hiring new people. What we realized is that we didn't have in-house expertise on Google, for example, right? So we were seeing our cost per leads were ballooning and getting out of control. And I didn't know how to you know, really rein them in. So you know what we did is we did something crazy and we paused our Google ads, right? We weren't doing AdWords for like two months because the numbers were just insane. And instead, we focused on LinkedIn because we had in-house expertise. We focused on getting it right. We focused on creating segmented ads. We focused on testing what content worked. We focused on tweaking things. So for example, you know, we were looking at the data one day and saw, hey, for the last two weeks, 60% of our ads have been spent before the U.S. even wakes up in most of our businesses uh-huh. in the U.S. because we had international ads running and we didn't break them up into distinct groups. So you know what we did is the next day we ran ads. Uh, we split the group up. So 75% of our ad spend went to the US, 25% went to the rest of the world. And we were able to preserve a lot of that budget that we were missing out on in the US because we looked at the data every day. But if we weren't focused on it, we were doing 10 things, we wouldn't have noticed it, right? If we were doing content syndication and dealing with those leads, uh, we wouldn't have seen that. But I think the, the last piece that has nothing to do with marketing, but has everything to do with sales is if you are non-focused and you're sending you know, variable quality leads to your sales team, they're not going to trust any of them. So I can go and look my sales team in the eye and say, you know, we sent you 15 leads today or 20 leads. And most of them are directors or above. Most of them are in marketing or corporate comms, which are some of our key segments. And if they're not converting for us, then we have to have a different conversation. But I feel like every call you make is valuable. And I couldn't do that if I wasn't focused on those areas. And you're a hundred percent right. It doesn't take many bad quote unquote, bad leads for them for to spoil the whole bunch, for them to just no longer have the urgency around them or the attention to them because they don't trust them. Yep. And if you're friends with the people on the sales team, they will razz you considerably for every bad lead. So you want to minimize (laughs) that as much as possible. They will. Uh, Yes, we could uh, owe them lunch for every wasted lead. But so with this kind of move to being data centric uh, as your organization and the process that you've gone through, how has that changed the way you've been um, viewed or how you've partnered with the other parts of the organization? So I think the biggest change has been with executive management. I think executive management historically was um, not weary, but was unconvinced of the efforts of the sales and marketing teams because we ultimately didn't have data to either back up our assertions to improve you know, a lot of it was shooting from the hip. So there would be frustration from management, rightfully so, to say, oh, why are you doing this? Okay, you're doing another webinar on this topic and tell me that it worked last time. Because we spend, you know, when you do a sponsored webinar with a partner, it's, you know, sometimes twenty or $30,000 and that's a lot of money. Yep. So now we can actually go and say, we're doing this because of XYZ reason. But even more important than that, we can every day make decisions ourselves that are, smart, intelligent, informed. And I'll tell you that in the last three or four months, we've gotten considerable backing from our executive team because they see that we're taking data to make informed decisions. And are we doing it fast enough? And are we doing it well enough? Like there's always room for improvement. I don't want to make it sound like we're perfect because we're far from it. But the decisions that we make and the efforts that we make are based on facts. So one example would be this topic of brand storytelling. And that's something that us marketers care a lot about. It's telling the story of your company So people want to work with you. And what we see is that that's an area that's resonating with executives and marketing folks and corporate communications people. And because we had that data, we then went and built a resource page on our site. And now we can go and build ads around that. And now we can test that. But the reason that we spent 20 hours of people's time yesterday doing that was specifically for the reason that we had data to justify the investment of our time and effort and energy. And when we go and find another um, partner to work with on our next webinar, we can justify that to say, we've gotten a ton of high quality leads that are interested in this topic. It's an area that we understand well. And by the way, five of the opportunities we created in the last two weeks were from this piece of content. That's a lot easier of a conversation than I think brand storytelling is meaningful and we should do more of it. Yep. No, that's powerful stuff. 
So what is the, what do you see as the next steps in your guys' data journey? I think it's just really tying everything together more effectively. You know, the tool that we're relying on right now is primarily Google Data Studio, which is okay. It's a good tool. It's a nice tool. We're a Google, you know, company here in terms of our productivity suite. So we're on Google a lot. It helps you blend and merge data with each other, but it, it doesn't feel to me like an enterprise solution for what we're actually trying to achieve. So it's a, it's a bridge, I think, until we figure out what we ultimately want to deliver internally. And again, the challenge is how do you connect different systems that don't pass certain pieces of information through? So like, it's really easy for me to go to LinkedIn data and leads that we've generated from LinkedIn for this month and figure out where they are in the buyer's journey in, in Salesforce, but I can't then go and compare that to my budget. There's probably a way to do it. We have a new ops guy that joined us recently that will be enormously helpful in, in pulling that information, but it's just not easy to do. So I think for us, it's having these daily meetings, figuring out what other metrics are important for us to drive um, innovation and change, and then continuing to test the things that we do on a daily or monthly basis to see if they're actually working. And once we get to that perspective and can actually say, we know this drives wins, this drives opportunities, uh, then maybe we um, can look at the next thing and the next thing. But it's short term, continuing to institutionalize data internally. Long term, it's finding better tools and technology that will allow us to um, collect, collaborate, and analyze that data at a high level more efficiently. Yeah, you've come so far and it's always fascinating, I think, in all the data journeys, all, all the improvements we do in product marketing, you can look back and you take the moment to look back, you can see how far you've come and that's easy to lose sight of because there's always so much more opportunities uh, to continue to improve. Yeah, I think the one, the one kind of important piece that I think us marketers tend to know, but other folks in the organization don't seem to understand because they don't live and breathe it every day is just how difficult it is to do something as simple as, you know, follow a leads journey, right? So for us, like if we generate a lead on LinkedIn, the first place it goes is into Marketo and then it goes into Salesforce and then it goes into Salesloft and we use a, you know, a partner that uses dialing software. So then it has to get sync with them. I mean, that's five systems for one lead to get a phone call to them. It's, it's amazing. And then not all of the data from all of those systems flow to any one place. So helping your organization understand the complexity of the tech stack is also really important. And you understanding the complexity, you know what you can realistically measure, what you can't measure, and then finding people that can help you bridge the gaps are important. That's such a good point because uh, we did make it just sound really easy. Like, um, so we track our leads down and it's hard. Yeah, and it's, it's so manual, hard. And it's, you know, for a while there, you're not um, even, you know, there's always a little bit of uncertainty in the data as the systems get synced up and you're trying to test through and, I think sometimes on the outside, it looks like, well, it's digital marketing. It should just, you know, automatically give you a trail. And you're like, well, I wish it did. <laughs> yeah, or, or sometimes, you know, one day something will work and the next day the same exact thing <laughs> oh, will just oh. not work. And there's no reason for it. Yeah, somebody made a switch on one of those five systems or maybe not, maybe it was a six system and all of a sudden the tracking doesn't work. Or exactly. Google stopped looking at it for whatever reason and, and you have to, go to all those systems and try and figure out what it might be. And it can sound like you don't either A, know what you're doing or you're B, making it up, right? Like, yeah, well, I we're not sure we're tracking it all. And you're like, oh. Yeah. And that's why, you know, from us, from a product perspective, because I know you have a, pro a lot of product managers who listen to this as well, like this whole idea of co-locating data and making it relevant and easy to understand and use and um, readily available is something that we do within our platform, right? We want to make sure that you can look at you know, article analytics as you're publishing them, that we can recommend tags for you based on the content that you're publishing, that we can give you uh, insight and analysis where you're producing content so that you can produce it more effectively. And that's, you know, something that's a differentiator for us. It's something that's important to us. It's something we believe as a company. And we're trying, uh, you know, not surprisingly to institutionalize that internally as well. It's a, it's a great comparison, Josh. There's the, there's all the insights that we work really hard to get as a product management and product marketing and marketing, we need to make sure whenever possible, we provide those insights to our customers in the product. Um, even if, yep. you know, even if it's uh, slightly different insights, but the ability to get insights because- And even it, our internal users, right? I mean, yeah. there are lots of internal users that are flying blind because they have to go to five different systems to find information. Right, or they only look at one and then they have the wrong story and then they, they go marching on that story and you're like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Like, but, but the numbers said this. It's like, well, you didn't look at these other four things that you probably shouldn't look at. 
Right, <laughs> exactly. All right, so for our listeners, then we've covered a lot of stuff, but if some company out there is listening and they're gonna start that, that data journey, like Perfect Sense is going through, what would, you, what would be two things that you would recommend that they just start doing immediately to help? I think number one is look backwards at your wins and see what kind of journeys people took to be successful. It doesn't have to be super detailed at first, but uh, get a sense of who are the people that are buying from you. It's easier in B2B, right? B2C is a little bit more difficult, but if you're in a B2B environment, who's buying from you and can you create segments off of that information to start testing? And then the second piece I would say is figure out benchmarks that you wanna gear yourself towards and focus. So the benchmarks are important. They don't have to be industry benchmarks necessarily because if you're starting your journey, your, ben your numbers may be you know, crazy high, crazy low. Uh, you probably wanna start with something realistic. So maybe it's a 10% improvement in your cost per leads or it's a 25% improvement in your conversion rate. I might be a little ambitious, but we're ambitious around here. <laughs> and, and then start figuring out the ways that you can do that right? Pick a metric that you can actually access easily, that you can understand quickly, that your team can get behind, and that you can actually have a, a way to change it. And then expand out, right? Take that first metric and then look at the next thing and look at the next thing because every step in a marketing process is interrelated, right? They're all going to have an impact on the upstream and the downstream, depending on where the person comes in. So there will be uh, impacts that you're you know, not expecting and unintentional impacts as a result. And only when you look at the full picture can you actually see that. But start small, focus on one or two key things, find a tool that will let you um, look at data across your platforms. Again, we're using Data Studio. It's a pretty easy to use tool, it's lightweight, and it's a good start for us, but it's probably not the end for us. And make sure your team looks at that data on a regular basis so that you can be reactive, but more importantly, that you can be proactive about seeing things that are working and not working and adjusting before you spend, you know, ten, dozens of hours and thousands of dollars on something that's not working. Awesome. Josh, it has been a pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me. It's always nice to chat and I love talking about data. So anytime you want to discuss it again, you let me know. I will. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thanks everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career. <laughs>